Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending and uh, watching this video. Um, so my name is Anthony Zazzarino, and I am an assistant professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. Uh, today's topic is going to be a brief uh, video about gender identity. Uh, we're going to get into how to work with this uh, gender diverse population. On this front slide, you can see all of my contact information and I encourage you to uh, reach out via email if you have any questions or would like some more information. Before I actually get into this topic, I do need to uh, thank my colleagues who work within the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative uh, and has reached out to me to complete this video for all of you. Um, the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative's mission is to improve the quality of care provided at New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals through consultation, education, program development, and evaluation all using psychiatric rehabilitation goals, values, and principles, as well as current research. And this presentation was made possible by the grant from the New Jersey Department of Health. And we are all very grateful for their support, which really makes the mission possible and allows me to present this information to all of you. Before we get started, I do need to, um, let you all know that this in no way means that this is going to be a very deep dive on this topic. I will encourage you all to take what you've learned from here and allow this to be the beginning of your education and your learning process about gender and gender diversity. So today we are going to spend some time talking about key terms uh, so that we can all be on the same language, right? And so that we can ground this conversation, though it might be one-sided right now, right? But we can ground maybe future conversations uh, of gender and gender identity. I'm going to highlight some of the health disparities that impact the lives of gender diverse individuals and discuss minority stress model and how we could really utilize this and, under, and how understanding the minority stress model will help improve our working with individuals uh, that are gender diverse. Also, we'll begin to explore different strategies to promote effective behavioral health care services. So before I get started, I do have to just uh, have a quick conversation about the difference between gender identity versus affectional identity. So as we're already having this conversation, you might be thinking to yourself, affectional identity, what is that? I've never heard of that. And I will say that uh, the term affectional identity is a newer term, very new, probably in the past couple months, I, it's uh, been used in literature and in conferences. When I'm mentioning affectional identity, I'm specifically talking about what you might know as sexual identity. So like lesbian, gay, bisexual, and there's many more. Today's topic is specifically on gender and gender identity, which is a very different construct than sexual identity or affectional identity. And what I notice um, and I've noticed this in some of my own research that we tend to lump everyone under this umbrella term uh, of the LGBTQ plus community. And though I think that is a beginning to recognize differences, right? And recognize um, uniquenesses, what ends up happening is we begin to lump two very distinct constructs into one and both affectional identity and gender identity are two very different things. And I always like to use this quote, though the language is slightly dated, uh, the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation 
is the difference between who you are and whom you love. So today, we will only be talking about who somebody is as a person, which has nothing to do with who somebody is attracted to, whether it's sexually, romantically, spiritually, emotionally. We're not getting into that today. It's just about gender and who you are. So this slide is a very loaded slide. Um, and this is when I begin to implore you all to take whatever knowledge you believe you have learned or taught about gender and try to erase it from our mind. We have been, um, we have had this concept of gender ingrained from such a very young age, right? In terms of you go to any store and you look at baby clothes, baby toys, they are very genderized. What I'm asking you to do is to truly separate out one's biological sex to one's gender. So sex and gender, not the same, right? Sex, that relates to one's biology. And there's a ton of research out there on that in terms of uh, what's going on uh, within the chemistry of a, of a pregnant individual and how that can impact things. Uh, but we know that one's sexual organs are different than one's gender. So what you might see here and what I will refer to as somebody who was assigned male at birth, which is the AMAB, or assigned female at birth, AFAB. So that was one's sex. Now, Gender is a very different construct, right? Gender is a very individualized, unique, personal psychological experience that is not necessarily tied to one's biology or behavior. When we're looking at gender, we're looking at the idea of its attitudes, feelings, behaviors, that really it's a given culture associates with one's biological sex. And what I ask you to do is to take that out of your mind because we need to recognize that gender is such a unique, individualized, internal aspect of that person. And gender is more than just one thing, right? We have one's gender identity and their gender expression. And this is where I think people begin to get even more um confused right so when we're talking about gender identity we're specifically talking about their internal individualized sense of gender so this is specifically how one person identifies themselves not how society identifies them right not how other people might believe somebody is it is uniquely and individualized to that person. Then we have this other idea of gender expression, right? Which is way, the way that people might present, right? Whether it's through clothing, through actions, through appearance, through demeanor. And that's what really begins to be interpreted by others around them. And that's how maybe other people begin to try to project gender onto somebody. Where the disconnect falls is the historical underpinnings of gender and that boys should dress this way, girls should dress this way, boys should act this way, girls should act this way. So what when we see somebody, right, that might express as what we historically would perceive as boy or girl, we then project that and we need to recognize that one's identity can have absolutely nothing to do with one's expression. So for example, um, perhaps today I came and was doing this presentation in a full dress with maybe some heels and some makeup. 
my expression is what one would historically perceive as more feminine and what one could maybe interpret as female. So if I was doing that in a room full of people, people might project their identity and assume that maybe my identity is of a female or trans. And we're gonna get into some of these, these words and language in a little bit, because it's so important. However, I might express myself one way and yet still identify in a different way. So I still might identify as a cisgender male. And we'll discuss that terminology in, in a second. The most important piece of this is that these two constructs, gender identity and gender expression are very different. So gender is very nuanced, right? And historically, when we learn about gender, we learn very concretely. Gender is male, gender is female. And in 2021, we know gender is a lot more than just that. In many cultures, right, there's multiple genders. And in many cultures, they accept multiple genders. And yet, we are still having a really difficult time trying to conceptualize this aspect that gender can be more than just that male-female binary. And when we have these conversations face to face, I always like people to kind of take a moment and reflect back in terms of what other attributes in our lives are constrained to just two constructs. We think about who we are as a person, right? Eye color, we have a ton, we got blue, we got hazel, we've got green, we've got gray, we've got a mixture. Talk about hair color. We've got bald, we've got blonde, we got brown, we got black, we've got all these different things. We talk about height, shoe size. We run this, the, a gamut uh, uh, on a spectrum of all of these different constructs. And yet, gender, we still have a really hard time looking at it as more than just male and female. So what you see here on this slide is um, some really good information about how to begin to look at gender from a spectrum, right? That it is no longer okay to say gender is either this or gender is that. So some basic language, and I'm not going to go through um, all of these words and, and just read out loud. You have the PowerPoints, you're looking at this as I'm going through it. But when we talk about binary, that's when we talk about just that male or female. When we talk about non-binary, we're talking about it's a lot more than just that. Again, uh, here are some more uh, terminology that we need to recognize. So earlier, I mentioned cisgender male. So if you look over here on the bottom right, you see the term cisgender, and that definition is someone whose gender identity aligns with their assigned, uh, this should say sex at birth, right? So for instance, I was born a biological male. I have male sexual organs. My gender, I identify as a male, so therefore I am a cisgender male. We also have the concept of transgender, right? Which is when one's gender does not match their sexual organs. And then agender is a person who does not identify with any gender identity. These other two concepts are, are slightly different in terms of, we begin to look at more about gender expression here. So when we look at gender non-binary, we're looking at a, an individual who just does not fit within that socially defined binary of man and woman and tend to see that uh, their identity, they could say, I identify as gender non-binary, 
and they might be more fluid in their gender expression. And then gender queer is a more of an overlapping term. And I know that all of this is um, a lot new information and we might mess up from time to time and it's okay. I might even mess up doing this recording um, and we'll explain what we do when we get there. Again, just some more uh, terminology for you to pay attention to, but also to recognize so that when we're having conversations with people, we can talk about and utilize the appropriate language. So transgender male, woman, um, gender fluid, pangender, they're all here for you. A couple other um, terms I just thought is really important when we're having conversations about gender and gender identity is the term affirmation. Um, historically, I've heard language like um, sexual reassignment surgery, or this person is transitioning, or they're going through a transition, right? When we're talking about transgender individuals. Some of the language around that is actually shifting to be more empowering and more affirming. So instead of saying that one is in the midst of transitioning, right? We recognize that one is going through the affirmation process, which is the process of moving from a designated sex at birth to a gender identity and gender expression that's congruent and authentic and harmonious with who they are. And from that context, I just want you to take it back a little bit and think about why is that wording so important? I want you to think of that term transition and what does that imply? Transition to me sounds like, okay, I'm just going from one thing, you know, that I, that I am to maybe something different and we'll see what goes on. But affirmation is so empowering, right? It highlights that who I am is now who I can be, who I've always known I have been is now who I can be. And that then coincides with this word, uh, the, the gender confirmation surgery, right? We're confirming, we're not reassigning, we're not transitioning, we are confirming that my sexual organs or who I am is is who I will be after the surgery, right? And this can conclude, can include a lot of different surgeries and can include upper surgeries, lower surgeries, and very big myth, not every individual who is trans or transgender will move forward with gender confirmation surgery. That's a whole nother discussion, right? We don't have the time here. You'll be sitting in front of your computer for hours if we go into everything in such detail. Again, why I'm asking you and imploring you that today is not the only time you take some time to learn about this. Today is just the beginning of your learning process. The other important piece when we're talking about gender and gender, gender identity is gender pronouns. Um, there's a list of them here, and I know uh, a lot of times people are like, well, I hear this, I hear this often, actually. Um, not even, uh, not only do I work at Rutgers, I also do some, uh, I run some groups, uh, mental health groups at an adult and adolescent partial hospital program and intensive outpatient program, and do some private practice specifically with um, individuals that are struggling with their gender identity or affectional identity. And one of the biggest things that I hear often is connected to gender pronouns, where people get upset over being uh, misgendered, right, or using inappropriate pronouns. I also hear many times, well, it's really difficult. And yeah, it is, sometimes it could be difficult, right? Like if I have engaged in conversation with somebody for a set of number of years, right? And I've always referred to this person as he, and now this person is recognizing that they 
are not in fact a cisgender male and, and would like to maybe utilize a different pronoun, it might get confusing to me. So when we talk about pronouns, I'm not saying that it is um, easy. And it might not be easy, but it is so imperative that we recognize and validate the pronouns that people want to be referred to. And we used to use the term chosen pronouns. No, no, sorry. We used to use the term preferred pronouns. And that is also shifting, right? Because it's not a preference. Like, it's not like, mm, I prefer Coke over Pepsi. It's a chosen pronoun. This is who I am. And a lot of times I always, um, I, uh, when I've interacted with family members who've had a hard time and um, I, I always, have a conversation about how important identity is to themselves. And there's a really good video at the end, and I'll, I'll, remind, my, I'll remind you all as to where it is at the end of this presentation to uh, watch uh, a group of young adults, uh, emerging adults, talk about the importance of pronouns and why it's so important to them to be acknowledged and recognized by their appropriate pronoun. When I meet with people, I often lead conversation with high um, in clinical practice, not like at the grocery store, right? I'm not like gonna go up to the, the grocery attendant and be like, oh, hi, my name's Anthony. I go by he, him, his. But in a clinical format, when I'm meeting new clients for the first time, I do say, oh, hi, uh, so and so, I'll use their name that's on their form and say, you know, my name is Dr. Anthony Zazarino, and I go by the he, him, his pronouns. Why do I do that? I do that for a couple reasons. I do that because I would like to normalize that conversation a little bit more. Now, if the other person that I'm engaging with has never thought about it, because it wasn't important to them, they might breeze right over it and we might not ever have that conversation. But I'm also recognizing that there are differences in gender and that there is a diversity within gender and gender identity. So that other person on the other side of that table or room might recognize that and say, oh, this person is welcoming. This therapist, this counselor is welcoming and might refer back to, oh, thank you. Um, I go by she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. And now I've just validated that person's being just from saying three words in addition to my introduction. The other thing I do very often now um, is I don't use the he, him, his, or she, her, hers pronouns unless I know for certain that that's the pronoun that the individual goes by. So for me, I find it better to just kind of use a universal they, them, theirs. And that takes a little bit of time because historically we use they for or them for two people. And again, we need to recognize this is not about us and our comfortability. This is about validating and opening up that conversation for other people. This last one on the list, Z, Zier, Ziers, or here, here's, uh, that also uh, is a different gender neutral pronoun, one that's not as commonly used here. Um, and there are others. So again, let this just be the beginning of this understanding of pronouns. So I said, what do we do as uh, helping professionals? So a couple of general guidelines is one, just becoming more aware of our own biases, becoming more aware that gender is not just a binary. And again, thank you taking some time to listen to this presentation because by doing this, you're already trying to become more aware. The other thing is we need to pay more attention and be more mind, mindful 
of the language that we use. What do I mean by that? I would love everyone to take some time in your daily language and try to be more aware, try to bring to your consciousness the words that you use and how genderized you are. How many times you refer to things as she or they or them or her or him and begin to catch yourself with how much gender you place on other people and objects, right? When you mess up, you got to catch yourself. And that's why we need to become more aware of the language that we use, right? We know language is so powerful. In the field that we're all working in, our words matter. So I ask you first to become more aware of your language in everyday life so that we can then become more aware of the language we use when we're interacting with others. And if we mess up, we replace it. So if I was working with somebody um, and I accidentally referred to them as he when they had let me know that they would prefer to go by they or them, I would be more aware I'd catch myself and say, oh, Pat, I really apologize. I just heard that I used the wrong pronoun. Uh, let me replace it, and I'm going to continue to have that conversation. What I often find is that ability to catch yourself, apologize, replace it, and move right along makes that conversation a little easier. I do see oftentimes practitioners will make this big to do, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. And then it just becomes this big deal when we just catch ourselves, we apologize, we replace it, and we move on, right? Part of this is we need to recognize, and these are conversations I have with all of my clients. I'm still a human being and I am not perfect. I don't ever uh, try to be perfect. I just try to continue to practice without judgment, right? Because the more we judge our thoughts, the more we judge our language, the more it's going to stick to us. In DBT, uh, dialectical behavior therapy, there's a really great skill called the wave, right? Where we allow our feelings and our thoughts to enter. We acknowledge them, we validate them, we don't judge them, we don't hold on to them so that they can leave. And in this practice, it's the same thing, right? When we misgender someone, we catch it, we apologize, we replace it, and we don't place judgment on ourselves. Also, like I said, it is important to ask people how they identify. Um, we don't want to make assumptions. We don't want to uh, assume that people, that everybody is cisgender. Uh, we also do not want to assume that the language that people are using is accurately defined based on the definition that we know. So for instance, um, I work with a lot of teens. Anybody works with teens, you know their language is constantly changing. When it comes to time to, or when, it, when we're having conversations about gender, a teen might say something along the lines of, oh yes, I'm, I'm a trans man. Now in my mind, I know what my definition of is a, a, a trans man, right? I don't want to assume that my definition matches their definition. So a simple open-ended question of, tell me, what does a trans man mean to you? How do you define that? So we can have a conversation and be on the same page. 
for some reason, practitioners have a really difficult time doing that. And I like to just normalize that to any other conversation we would have with clients or with people that we're working with. So for instance, if a client was telling me, you know, I feel really anxious, Dr. Z, I wouldn't just assume, right, that I know exactly what their anxiety is feeling like. I would follow up with, thank you for telling me. Can you explain what, how, how you're feeling anxiety? How, what do you mean by anxiety? To try to understand their experience, right, or their definition of it. At the end of the day, if the person's definition of the word does not actually match, you could provide some education, right? And say, oh, you know, by the way, when you say trans man, what I know of is this, this, and this. But if you would like to refer as trans man, that's the language I will use, right? The only caution to this is if the word that they're using is derogatory, you know, um, some people still use the term transsexual, which is a very dated term, a term that we do not use anymore. I would have to have a conversation about why that term is so dated and maybe provide some education about, again, one's sex and one's gender. And I would use the more appropriate, less stigmatizing language in that conversation. Okay. So we just went through some conversation about language. And now we're gonna shift to action. What do we, now that we understand we're all speaking the same language, what do we know? What do we do? What we know is that gender and gender identity and gender constructs is not a new concept. I hear this often when people say to me, oh, this is some new fad. Take a deep breath, I swallow, and I educate. This is not a new fad. Gender and gender identity has been discussed as early as the 1970s. And I would implore that the research really isn't accurate in this. I would hypothesize that this goes even further back. And I say that because in so many different cultures, right? When I think of the Native American culture, we talk about different genders in terms of two spirits. That's dated way back. So we know that gender has always been a part of our society. In the mental health field, it really began in the 1970s where counselors began questioning the challenges that minorities experienced in counseling. We knew that things weren't right. In the mid 1970s, and I will use this dated term because this is what uh, it was called back then, that transsexual group therapy began to become a popular approach where me or as an individual who might identify, again, I will use this dated term as transsexual, have a general understanding of the experience that I've gone through and now I can maybe help others because sadly the mental health community was not about helping this group of people. And that's where you started to see in the 1980s, a peer-led support group emerging. Uh, emerging to really focus on gender diversity and to come from a strengths perspective. And we'll talk about why a strengths perspective is so helpful in the work that we do in a little bit. I throw this up here for you all, just to give you a sense of understanding that why do individuals who might not fit the gender norm, why they might feel hesitant to come into services or to come and seek treatment? One of the reasons is because if I come in and discuss 
not believing that my gender matches my sexual organs, and we discussed this at a longer time, I now have the stigma of this wonderful DSM-5 gender dysphoria diagnosis. There really is some, there really continues to be a lot of stigma around uh, gender in general, but also being labeled with a diagnosis. And that's really important to recognize when we're working with people from uh, different gender backgrounds and, and gender diverse communities that be really mindful of the power that this diagnosis can and does impact us. So as we look a little bit deeper within the gender diverse community, we know that this community faces such social stigmatization. In 2020, when we uh, began to see the big movement for the Black Lives Matters protests, we also started to see a big uh, movement for Black Trans Lives Matter as well. And yet, not as much focus was being paid uh, to that attention. Part of that is because people still don't understand and still don't fully, can't fully wrap their head around gender again and gender diverse, diversity. But we know that this population faces extreme intimidation, ridicule, threats, physical violence, discrimination, marginalization, Just in our last presidential term, there was a ban on trans individuals for being a part of the military. In 2020, this was still going on. And this population faces significant health disparities. So why is all that? One of the best ways to kind of frame this is this idea of the gender minority stress framework. We see here that there's a lot of external stigma, right? That we just mentioned, the discrimination, the oppression, the prejudice, the marginalization. We also know that that can translate and that people do have those internal stigmas, right? This feeling of guilt, this feeling of shame. Like, I don't want to come out as transgender because I don't want to put my family through all of this. So I'm just going to suppress it all and have this internalized shame and guilt. We also know that just general psychological processes that we all have can play a role. But we know that individuals that uh, are gender diverse experience much higher rates of the external stigma and internal stigma. And all three of these factors lead to not only an increase in mental health problems, but also an increase in physical health problems. So what are those external or distal stressors? We know that uh, about 43 to 60% of gender diverse individuals have the highest level of physical uh, assault, right? 43 to 60% have been or have identified in some capacity as being physically assaulted. 43 to 46% have also identified experienced some sort of sexual violence. We also know that gender diverse individuals have an increase in substance use and are two to three times greater, two to three times more likely to attempt suicide. Now, 
Sadly, though these numbers are high, I would actually challenge the research and say that these numbers are even higher because of lack of reporting. We know that this community and this population do not feel as comfortable to come out and report such acts. So though these numbers are high, I would almost guarantee that there are the actual more factual numbers are even higher. Sadly, when we look at proximal stress, right, we there really is limited research uh, related to the impact of the expectations of violence, the expectations of discrimination, or internalized transphobia. We don't know yet how that actually does impact somebody from a research context. We do know that there is a history of concealment of gender identity mainly out of fear and avoidance. Again, we don't know what that concealment and that internalized proximal stressor, what that truly does for uh, individuals in the gender diverse community. So where do we begin? As behavioral health workers, we need to begin to affirm gender identity and expression presentation that goes far beyond that male-female binary. I always find it really interesting when I'll be out with a friend, you know, we'll come across and maybe see a dog, right? And, you know, we'll pet the dog and I'll hear other people come up, oh, how old is she? And they'll, you know, place a gender on a dog and they don't know. And it always interests me when the owner gets very upset about the fact that you just call my dog a she, but this is a he, this is a male dog. And I say that because I want you all to think about situations that you've come into contact with and how we can be very mindful and very offended when we misgender someone's dog. And yet maybe human beings don't get that same respect. So for us, as behavioral health care workers, we have to be the ones to affirm them. We have to be the ones that recognize that gender is so unique, the gender identity is so unique and individualized to that person. And because you are who you are, I love you, I support you, and I'm going to validate. We also have to recognize our own biases, right? We need to recognize, and that's with everything. I mean, I don't, I feel like I don't need to spend much time on that, but if you don't think you're biased, uh, go please take an implicit bias uh, uh, assessment. Um, we all have them and, it, and it's important to recognize and just own them. We need to recognize that intersections of identities, right? So when we talked about the minority stress model, well then how does the how does the minority stress of being a gender diverse individual, how does that overlap with the minority stress of being maybe an African American gender diverse individual, an Asian American gender diverse individual, an African American gender diverse female? Right, so we need to recognize all the different intersection identities that kind of uh, impact the person that we're working with. We also have to understand that we may miss up, mess up or misstep. And again, we pay attention to it, we apologize for it, we correct it and we move on. What I see sometimes is practitioners being very uncomfortable and they'll just try to quickly like sweep it under the rug and like move on very quickly. Without taking the time to apologize, you're not recognizing that you did something wrong. And by misgendering or by not affirming someone, we have done something wrong. Just being a part of this presentation would be 
beginning to understand and have conversations about that range of gender identity beyond that male female binary. There's a whole other conversation that has to be had about the whole coming out process. Um, personally, I struggle even with the terminology of coming out. Um, you know, we don't have people in society being like, hey, everyone, I'm cisgender, or hey, everyone, I'm heterosexual. Um, so I feel like I always, when I'm working with people um, in a more empowering way, reframe that to letting in, right? Like that letting in process. I trust you enough to let you into who I am. I don't need to come out to anybody. But that letting in process has a full range of anxieties, complexities, hesitancies, um, especially based on age, right? Especially based on um, different beliefs and values can really uh, be it can really be a, an important concept and, and conversation to have. We also have to continue to understand the impact of transphobia, heterosexism, and cisgenderism, right? We need to recognize that these things do exist and living in a world where you might not be cisgender or heterosexual or uh, or you might be, or, or people might be transphobic, we have to recognize that what does that do for that person, right? What's that internal feeling? What's that concealment? Again, recognize the difference between gender identity and gender expression. We have to have really good resources and referrals for people. And we have to check those referrals, right? If we're working with somebody and, and, and they come to us and we give them a referral for maybe a higher level of care, for maybe a lower level of care, for maybe a support group, whatever the reason is. And they take us up on it and they reach out to that referral and it's not an active referral, we've just lost them, right? So we need to be really up to date with our resources and our referrals. And at the end of this presentation, I have a couple slides that have some really good resources for you. So what do we do about the environment, right? We know that when people come to see us, the first thing they see before they even interact with me is the environment in which they're coming. We have to try and create, not try, I take that back. See, I corrected myself, I caught myself, I'm correcting myself and I'm willing to change it. We must create a safe and supportive and affirming, envir and affirming environment. If you do not have a visible non-discrimination policy, we need to get one. We need to have our trainings. We need to support reflection of people, of staff. We need to have gender diverse, inclusive materials, right? When you go into an office, be really mindful of the pictures and the pamphlets that you see. We need to include more pictures and more pamphlets than just cisgender, heterosexual, white individuals. That's how we begin to create acceptance and, and an affirming environment. Also thinking about bathrooms, and I know that's a whole nother controversial topic, and we can get away from that by having just one unisex individual bathroom. Anybody can come and go in that. Often too, I think something um, just as simple as, um, you know, everybody's very familiar with the, the rainbow flag and its representation of the LGBTQ community. There are different flags for different gender and gender identities, but one that might just demonstrate a safe and supportive and affirming environment is uh, the trans flag, right? The blue and pink lines. 
And we see a lot of these in June, right? When it's National Pride Month. And then all of a sudden, I guess people don't support or don't have pride anymore. I can say with certainty that just displaying something like that means a big deal to gender diverse individuals. It means that you are aware of gender diversity and that you are accepting. So something as little as even a magnet, a picture, a flag, whatever it is, takes one step closer to creating that safe, supportive, affirming environment. Our documentation, I see this all the time when I go in, I'm really mindful of, of these things when I go to my own doctor's appointments and uh, you know, you have to fill out all that paperwork and uh, people don't really think twice about it. Um, the forms that people fill out, we need to get away with trying to put people in boxes. Male, female, I see this a lot, male, female, trans, other. All right, we're trying, All right? We're trying to recognize that there is more than just male and female. We're not going to cover all gender identities on a form. I get that. I get we're not gonna put all of these different boxes. Why can't we just add a, a line that says, gender, please identify, and allow the person to feel empowered to educate and identify who they are. So that's what I see a lot now, and that's what I always recommend is having those write-in sections. Again, using the pronoun and the name that the person requests. And I know that this can be different in terms of uh, like a legal medical record that if the person hasn't legally changed their name, their medical record still needs to go by their biological name. And that's worthwhile to have a conversation that says, you know, yes, on paper, I have to go by this name, but I recognize and I value you as a person and I will refer to you in the name that you are requesting. Respecting confidentiality, don't out someone. Um, I often in class when I teach, and, and I've read a couple things about this where you know, in order to be more gender inclusive, uh, many organizations, many businesses, many universities will start a meeting or training or a class and say, hi, my name's Anthony. I go by he, him, his. Can you please tell me your name and your pronouns? And I think in theory, that sounds really good, right? It sounds very welcoming, but remember, there might be a person or two that's in that business meeting, that's in that organization, that's in that class, that may not feel comfortable, may not feel like this is a safe space, may not feel ready to identify themselves with a different pronoun, right? And so then you have a couple of things. One, you're forcing somebody to technically come out in an environment in which they're not ready to, or two, they go by a different pronoun and now you've just supported that internalized guilt and shame. So something I do in class often is I will say, hi, my name is Anthony and I go by the he, him, his pronouns. And when you introduce yourself, if that's important to you or if you would like to share, please do so. So we're giving that option. And many times I think a lot of my students, they don't and, and um, they just keep moving it on, but I know that I have at least not forced somebody to either conceal their identity or come out when they were not comfortable yet. Again, we have to recognize that this process is a very individualized process that looks very different for every single person. And I feel like I should not have to say this in a presentation to behavioral health care workers, but we need to promote more empathy, compassion, care, sensitivity, flexibility. Uh, we need to, especially, um, especially now, I mean, always, but especially now, people are struggling. Um, people's mental health is struggling. We need to understand that and we need to 
try to express that in the work that we do. How do we work through all that minority stress that we talked about earlier? Well, first is we do need to normalize the adverse impact of gender minority stress. We need to acknowledge that, right? We need to recognize what that is. We need to have conversations about that. We then need to facilitate emotional awareness, regulation, and acceptance. Again, we recognize it, we bring it to the surface, we lay it out there, and then we work through it. Right. One of the ways we work through it is teaching assertiveness skills, right? We teach people to have a proper assertive communication. So for example, I've done many uh, individual sessions with clients where I teach them how to correct somebody when they have been misgendered or when somebody has assume, assumed their gender. And how to do that in a very polite, professional way, because I recognize that being misgendered will most likely stir up a lot of emotions and one's initial reaction might be to say, don't, I'm not a she, I'm a he, please call me a he, I told you this time and time again. And I understand that reaction and, and from a DBT standpoint, right, from dialectical behavior therapy, I can see that one's coming from the emotional mind and we need to try to get them from that wise mind to have that assertive communication to be able to educate um, because perhaps that person either A, wasn't aware that they used that term or misgendered somebody or B, they just didn't know. So teaching that assertive communication allows that person to feel empowered that they're able to navigate those, those constructs and those conversations. We need to begin to restructure that minority stress thought process, right? Those cognitions of I'm not good enough I'm not worthy, I can't be who I am. That takes a lot of time. Validating those unique strengths of gender non-conforming individuals, right? And not in a way that's minimizing or patronizing. I hear often, oh, you're really brave to dress like that. What a backhanded compliment, right? That is not a validating moment. Being really specific and saying, thank you and I appreciate you for feeling comfortable to be who you are right now. Affirming healthy and rewarding expressions of gender. And lastly, fostering a supportive relationships in the community. And this is where um, it's important to maybe have positive referrals to help people get to another uh, support group. Again, where these referrals and resources can come in handy. Another really good concrete way to work with people that are gender diverse is looking at a, a wellness model. Um, I am a licensed professional counselor and I come from uh, you know the counseling world and, and I'll discuss the counseling wellness model that, that I've used. Any wellness model will support, right? From a psychiatric rehabilitation uh, philosophy, we are talking about the uh, eight dimensions of wellness that you can see from uh, SAMHSA, right? The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Using a wellness model is a great alternative to support people from a strengths perspective. We need to continue to build up the the strengths that people have and use those strengths to help kind of create that balance, right? And use those strengths to help highlight to somebody, you are worthy, you are good enough. So here is one uh, specific, again, I said the is well model from a counseling perspective that looks at all of these different constructs. And in the um, resources, there is an article that will actually navigate you and take you through 
how to specifically apply this wellness model to an individual that identifies as transgender. So I will uh, encourage you to take a look at that. The last thing I have to just kind of raise your awareness to is the, if you are working with anybody that identifies as transgender, you must know and you must be familiar with the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, the WPATH. Uh, their goal and their mission is to promote evidence-based care, education, research, advocacy, public policy, and respect in transgender health. They have established standards of care that are free. Not only are they free, but they come in 18 different languages and they offer so many different resources and, and for uh, legal resources for youth, for family. If you work with transgender individuals, you need to take a look at this website and I have it here for you. So as we uh, get to the end of this presentation, again, I need to reiterate that um, this should not be the end of your learning on this topic. I always like to end this presentation with these two quotes. I just really enjoy them. Uh, the first one states, my body does not define who I am. I am a boy, but my body may show different. I know who I am. And I don't need anyone to tell me and call me what I'm not. And the second one is be who you are, not who the world wants you to be. We need to recognize that gender identity is an individualized process and that only a person can identify who they are. And we need to respect that. We need to understand that. We need to validate that and we need to affirm that. So uh, I hope you were able to learn a little bit about language. I hope that you could maybe take away some of these key terms so that you can be uh, able to have conversations about gender and gender identity. Um, we just touched a little bit about the health disparities that impact the lives of gender diverse individuals. We talked a little bit about this minority stress model, and I hope I gave you some strategies to promote effective behavioral health care services in this presentation. In terms of resources, again, um, here's some really good publications that I know of that I would always recommend. Um, trying to find local resources is very important. Some conferences, some online resources. Here is the one YouTube video that I was talking to you about, um, specifically about pronouns. I encourage you to, to take a look at that. And I believe in here, um, in these resources, there is the article um, that will help you uh, identify how to physically apply, not physically, how to actually apply uh, the wellness model to, um, to an individual that is transgender. Here it is, it is this first one, transitioning into wellness. Um, so take a look at this if, if you get an opportunity. As always, again, I just wanna thank you for being a part of this presentation. Um, be sure to catch out many of the other videos that are on the websites. And if you have any questions, please go back to that first slide, Feel, uh, get my email address, feel free to email me anytime. And thank you uh, for being here. And it was a pleasure to just uh, have this one-sided conversation, but nevertheless, a conversation about gender and gender identity. Have a good rest of your day.